Okay, for today we are moving into the area of Mesoamerica, so we're moving south of the border. Uh, this is the first of a few different lectures that we're going to have, um, but today we're going to be focusing on the Gulf Olmec. So, to give you a general overview of Mesoamerica before we get started, there are a few cultural traditions we're going to cover. The first will be today's lecture on the Olmec, located in the Gulf Coast region. We'll move to, well actually you already talked about the Valley of Mexico um, when you talked about Teotihuacan yesterday in class. Um, we're going to talk about the Maya area next week, and then we're going to go back to the Valley of Mexico to talk about the Aztec Empire. Give you a general chronology for Mesoamerica. It starts with the pre-classic or formative period from 1800 BCE to 300 CE. This is when we see the widespread um, Gulf Olmec art and culture. Also, Teotihuacan emerges around this time. The Classic period, however, from 250 to 600 CE, is when we see the real height and decline of Teotihuacan. Also, this is the Classic Maya period. In the Epiclassic period, from 600 to 900 CE, we have the decline of the Maya, and also the occupation of the northern frontier, which is where my research is based. The early post-classic uh, is, is the height of the Toltec Empire, which is more of a central Mexico phenomenon. But we will push through those and talk mostly about the late post-classic period from 1200 to 1519 CE, which is the Aztec Empire, also called the Triple Alliance, and that ends with the Spanish conquest of Tenochtitlan. Okay, giving you the timeline, we're going to talk today about the Olmec, but we'll, you've also, we're also talking about Teotihuacan, the Maya period, which actually extends much further back than what's shown here, and then the Aztec, which we'll talk about next week. When it comes to early Mesoamerican societies, there's a few things to know. So around 2000 BCE, this is when we have sedentary villages that are dispersed across um, both the diverse highland and lowland environments. These areas are, are connected though. We see evidence of exchange networks that would have been sharing resources between these different, different areas. Between 2000 to 1000 BCE, we start to see the development of small, powerful chiefdoms that are developing in several different areas. So the Olmec and the Gulf Coast, which we'll talk about today. But what we're seeing up here in the upper right are shaft tombs. These are mostly concentrated in western Mexico around this same time and would have had some kind of lineage of uh, rulership of uh, people being put into the same tombs over time. And then there's also San Jose Magote, which is the development in the Valley of Oaxaca around this time. Typical traits that we start to see develop um, amongst Meso Mesoamerican civilizations at this time, there's the ball game, pyramids, human sacrifice, or ritual bloodletting by, done by leaders or priests, obviously maize agriculture, um, the, the Feathered Serpent is a deity that we see developing now and goes all through the Mesoamerican um, civilizations. Also this concept of a tripartite cosmos or the world tree and being able to move amongst the, you know, the underworld, the earth, and then the, the heavens above. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> When it comes to the formative period itself, you know, we're seeing these are full-time farmers, there are urban centers developing at these places I've already mentioned. Um, there's very standard sorts of material culture, pottery, looms for textile production, but also groundstone and clay figurines. These groups are ruled by leaders, um, elders, shamans, or chiefs. There is definitely some social status differentiation, and in some cases it can be quite extreme. We have regional differentiation, but also a connection between, by trade networks between areas. And most specifically, the formative period is known as the, for the rise of the Olmec civilization. It's a widespread trade network, and we see the diffusion of Olmec traits into many different areas at this time. All right, in the pre-classic period, these are several sites that were important to know um, and were occupied during this time period. But for today, we're going to be focusing on three major centers um, for the Olmec, which first would be San Lorenzo, then it shifts to La Venta, and finally Tres Zapotes is at the very end of what we consider the, the Olmec time. The location of the Olmec along the Gulf Coast here is actually very convenient in certain ways because 
this uh, Tehuantepec Isthmus is what this area is called. It connects, you know, central Mexico here to the Maya area along the Yucatan Peninsula. But this low area um, would, would have had rivers connecting different areas, but also would have allowed people to travel all the way down along the Pacific coast as well. So we see connections between not only the Gulf Coast area, but communities along the Pacific coast as well. It's a very dynamic time. When we consider the Olmec chronology, so the earliest evidence we have are offerings that were made at the site of El Manati, which I'll talk about in a bit. This dates to approximately 1500 BCE. The rest of these periods or uh, subperiods, early pre-classic is the occupation of San Lorenzo. The middle pre-classic, we see the shift of focus to La Venta. And then finally, late pre-classic, we have the occupation, the beginnings of the occupation of Tres Apotes, but I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. As far as uh, comparative chronology goes, this gives you a sense of where we are in time relative to the other cultural areas we've talked about, so the Mississippian um, Mound Builder Societies, but also you know, the U.S. Southwest groups we've talked about before. So we're moving backwards in time as we move south. The, and then below there you can see, you know, for the Gulf Olmec, this is the period 1500 to 100, 400 BCE, it's slightly debated. San Jose Magote is also occupied around this same time period. And then we're seeing during this time also the development of Teotihuacan in central Mexico, which lasts until about 600 CE. So who were the Olmec? Well, the name itself is actually Nahuatl, which is the language of the Aztecs and it means rubber people. So this was actually referring to people who worked rubber in this area 2,000 years after the Olmec, but the name has just stuck around um, since then. These are the people who occupied the Gulf Coast of Veracruz and Tepazco from 1500 to 400 BCE, but as I said, this ending date is slightly disputed. And this area is characterized by swampy lowlands, which are also punctuated by low hills, ridges, and volcanoes. So it's a very volcanic environment at the same time as being very wet and highly productive for agriculture. This is what's considered the first Mesoamerican civilization. So it, because it has traits such as public architecture, it is very much a standardized, unique artwork um, corpus. There is high stratification, long distance exchange, evidence of pictographic writing, and some people have argued that it was organized as a state, but we'll talk about that again near the end. It's also famous for what's called the mother culture versus sister cultures debate, which I will give you some more information on in a minute, but it really comes down to the widespread area over which Olmec art and artifacts have been recovered. So it's an area that's not just the Gulf, Gulf homeland, it's 20 times larger than that. We see Olmec art in several other places, hundreds of kilometers away. Here we can see the Gulf lowland itself, or the Gulf homeland of the Olmec um, itself, with the major centers that were occupied. Um, one thing to keep in mind that's really important is not only was this area very rich in alluvial soils, so the river soils and these swamp environments, but they also had access then to diverse resources um, in both, in, in these certain areas. And the rivers themselves actually provided a transportation network among sites and also allowed them to make it out to the coast where then they could, you know, move on to other areas as well, kind of connecting in with maybe the Yucatan Peninsula or further up the Gulf Coast to other areas. So the Olmec are best known for several things, um, probably First and foremost are the colossal stone heads. They also have these tabletop altar thrones. We're not actually sure how they were used exactly, but we'll talk about that again in more in a minute. And then also stone stele, which are monumental. These are all monumental pieces of art. Olmec motifs or art style and the themes that go with that, something we'll talk about in a bit, is the shamanic transformation. Um, and also these mythical creatures called were jaguars. You're seeing one right here. <clears throat> and then also an early representation of the feathered serpent. They're also best, very well known for the ceramics, figurines, and greenstone artifacts, which I'll show you a little bit more in a minute. This institution of kingship really develops at this time. And we see, as we see depictions of what appear to be individual rulers, 
and their involvement in ritual ceremonies. And finally, as I already said, you know, an early form of writing, potentially. So the history of research in this area um, begins in the late 19th century, when there's an antiquarian from Mexico traveling through. He actually documents the first um, Olmec monument found in situ, which was Monument A, one of the colossal heads at Tres Apotes. Later on into the 19th century, we start seeing Olmec artifacts discovered. They're being associated, though, with the Maya culture that had already been defined uh, before this. In the 1930s and 40s, we see the first excavations happening. Matthew Sterling of the Smithsonian was one of the first people to work down there. He, together with Miguel Covarrubias, um, they actually became convinced that the Olmec predated most other Mesoamerican civilizations, so maybe not the, uh, you know, a Maya culture after all. And this culminates with, in 1942, when Alfonso Caso declares the Olmecs were the mother culture of Mesoamerica. And this concept is still debated you know, today, 60 years later, 60, 60 plus years later, actually, at this point. <clears throat> so, the origins of the Gulf Olmec. Well, there were early farming societies in this area since about 5100 to 4600 BCE. The earliest remains, though, actually, that are dated come from El Manati, around 1600 to 1500 BCE. This area in general is very highly productive, um, and that would have encouraged not only dense population in these areas, but then the triggering of a ri the rise of an elite class. So it's believed that families might have been able to acquire the most fertile lands or prime fishing and waterfowl locations and that they would have been able to transform that into, into wealth and uh, an elite status. In order to symbolize this newfound power, the elites then would have built these awe-inspiring ritual centers. They demanded symbolic and luxury items to be produced that would have helped, that are what we use now to define the Olmec culture. So these rulers would have been legitimizing themselves through staging public rituals that would have position them with this supreme authority and this relationship with the deities. <clears throat> and these precincts that they created, you know, you're surrounding all of your followers with these colossal statues of you, depictions of you, um, your, your, your deeds or things that you've done in your lifetime on the stela. We'll see a bit more of this when we talk about some of the individual sites. So subsistence for the Olmec, um, like I've already said, this is a very productive and research-rich area. In the upper right, you can see what one of the swamps might have looked like. They did, however, use slash and burn um, a subsistence strategy as well to clear forest growth. So that's what you can see in this image here, is they would have come down and cut out the major trees in the area and then burned whatever, whatever um, cover, ground cover would have already been there to then transform these areas into fields. They did have a pretty complex agricultural structure, so the natural river levees themselves would have been very productive and received lots of rain during the summers and would have had this very rich mud or silt associated with them, which was good for agriculture. But in more of the upland areas, they actually were able to do double crops. So they could have produced two different things, one in the wet season and one in the dry season, based on not only uh, river access, but the rain agriculture as well. They cultivated several things, maize, bean squash, also sweet potato and manioc, which you can see down here. It's a tuberous sort of plant um, and is nowadays associated with tapioca. They also did a lot of um, fishing and hunting though as well. So things like peccary, um, actually domesticated dog was the most plentiful pr protein source found in middens in this area. But they would have had riverine and coastal resources as well. So we've got turtles and ducks, but also crabs and shellfish coming from the coastal environments. So very diverse diet for them. When it comes to domestic architecture, um, we know most of our information from centers, these big large centers, which were largely ceremonial. Um, but the majority of the population would have resided in nearby villages and hamlets. We just don't have a lot of data on those sites um, at this time. They would have been located on the higher ground um, and typically consisted of these thatch sort of constructions, which you can see in the images here on the right. These are modern 
buildings, but gives you an idea of what these, uh, these communities would have looked like. The dwellings themselves would have been the house, but then also some kind of lean-to outside, and then storage pits where they would have kept their food supplies. One really important thing is what they call a house garden. Um, this is a small little patch of land they would have had right near their home for medicinal and cooking herbs, but also where they could have grown smaller crops, such as domesticated sunflower, um, avocado, and cacao trees would have been nearby as well. But then they would have traveled to their fields, which were located outside of the villages. In terms of settlement patterns, uh, we see really dense concentration in and around the major centers themselves. So what you can see here is a survey map near San Lorenzo. So San Lorenzo was the major center at that time, very, very highly populated area. And you can see the different sorts of different types. I'm not sure what the types mean in terms of the, the sites themselves, maybe the types of architecture that were there, the size of them. But you can see that it's very highly concentrated right around San Lorenzo. And then there are certain areas that weren't occupied at all. Um, so definitely what we call a site hierarchy, that most people would have been concentrated in and around the major centers and a much more dispersed population settlement um, around those areas. All right, cosmic, or the Olmec cosmology. There were obviously religious activities that would have been performed by the rulers, but also full-time priests or shamans. The rulers themselves were linked to the deities or supernaturals, which would have, again, helped to legitimize their role as these supreme authorities. There's a lot of evidence of these transformation figures. So this image down here especially, you can see it's this combination of human and like feline sorts of characteristics. I'll show you some better examples in a minute. The concept of the tripartite cosmos begins with the Olmec. Animals were very symbolic in their culture. Uh, it's thought that people would have had animal spirits associated with them. And we see lots of depictions of jaguars, serpents, eagles, and monkeys. But it's important to keep in mind that we don't have much direct evidence of what the rituals would have been like uh, among in Olmec society. So a lot of our interpretations are based on comparisons um, of the monumental and portable art that they had in comparison to how, how these objects would have been used or their significance in other Mesoamerican mythologies. Um, the development, however, of what's considered later on the feathered serpent and possible early variant of the rain deity are already in the pantheon at this time. So these are gods that were already becoming significant and continue to be significant amongst other Mesoamerican civilizations um, later on. So the Olmec were first and foremost, it was defined as an art style. We didn't know it was necessarily a culture, cultural tradition, but there was um, a very clearly defined art style and has very obvious characteristics. So the first being that there are full round carving, but also low relief that uses many different media. So jade objects, we see clay figurines, we see basalt carvings, as well as greenstone being highly polished. The depictions themselves vary, vary. They can be very naturalistic or realistic. Um, however, sometimes they're highly stylized or abstracted symbols or iconography or very fantastical anthropomorphic figures, which we see especially with the transformation of the shamans. The common motifs that we're going to see over and over again are a cleft head, the flame brow, snarling mouth, um, what's called a U bracket or the paw wing in particular are specific motifs themselves. Um, crossed bands, especially in the eyes, is very common. Babies, uh, and also these were jaguar creatures, which we'll see in a sec. There are two major forms of art, the stone monuments, so the colossal head like the one you can see depicted here on the right. Also the altar thrones and stela, and then more just freestanding sculptures themselves. Then there's also the portable art, which tends to be a much more widespread. Um, this is masks, votive axes, celts, figurines, and pottery. And I'll walk you through each of these um, in particular. Beginning with colossal heads. So these are enormous helmeted, helmeted heads that were carved from single blocks or boulders of basalt that would have come from the Tushla Mountains. 
in some cases, several kilometers from where these centers were located. So it's very likely they were created at workshops near the source and then dragged or floated, as you can see on the bottom here, to their final destination. Some of these were actually recycled or recarved later on. Um, we're not really sure why this was done. It could be due to a lack of material, or maybe there's some sort of ritual significance. If the, the ruler has died, maybe they have to kill all depictions of them before the new person can take over. Many of these have been mutilated, buried, or disinterred. So this has been interpreted as more likely to be in internal strife, but perhaps there was competition among centers and someone, another center might have been invaded by uh, another local power. But these are very individualistic representations. It's been observed that no two are really exactly alike. So it's not that the same person is being depicted over and over again. These are localized leaders, perhaps. In the end, though, no text explains them. We don't actually know what their meaning was, but there's lots of speculation. Most of the speculation nowadays comes down to them being portraits of rulers dressed as these ball players, And we'll show you some more evidence of that in a bit. Here you can see all 17 of the colossal heads that have been, um, have been discovered up to now. Uh, especially they're grouped by the sites where they're found. So the top row here, as well as this bottom guy, um, all 10 from San Lorenzo, only two from Tres Zapotes, and two from La Venta. La Corbada, Cobada is another site we're not going to talk about today. Um, these heads range in size. They're 5 to sometimes 11 feet tall, and they weigh anywhere from 25 to 55 tons. And what you should be able to notice is, as I said, they're individualistic, especially when it comes to the symbols that are on their, their helmets. This would have been maybe clan membership or significant of where those people came from. We're not, like I said, we're not really sure because there's no written text to help us understand their meaning. I'll show you a few examples of these. Um, this is one of the heads from San Lorenzo. Another San Lorenzo head. And yet another. This is um, two of the ones from La Venta. And you can see heavy, heavy, heavy evidence here of the mutilation scars that would have been left behind. And finally, one of the this was the original one that was found at Tres Zapotes. So this is how Olmec, the Olmec got on the map was when this one was discovered. There's also these things that we call altar thrones. Um, we're not entirely sure if they are places where people would have been seated and then um, as they presided over activities or ceremonies or met with their constituents, or they could have been the altars themselves where activities would have been performed. Stila are large upright monuments that would have been carved in more low relief. So it's um, depicting specific scenes, maybe act, uh, activities in which the rulers participated very much propaganda, and we'll talk about these a lot more when we talk about the Maya. They really go crazy with Stila. But then there's also full carving stone sculptures. So you see these feline depictions, but also combinations of you know feline headdress on a human head. Um, yeah. Moving into the portable art, so these are things that, you know, could have traveled much larger distances than these giant monuments. Um, jade masks are very common. They're made of a very precious material that would have been used to mark the rank of the elite class. They have very similar characteristics, these deep-set eyes and nostrils. You see this um, kind of downturned mouth that would have been potentially asymmet asymmetric. None of these, however, have been recovered at one of the major Olmec centers. We'll only find these in sites of other cultures. So this is the spread of that Olmec style being adopted maybe in other areas and used in a different media. These votive axes, these are all depictions of these wear jaguars. So it's this combination of, you know, human, human, feline combination creatures. Um, this is where we see a lot of those motifs that I was talking about. So all of these have a cleft head, with this little, well, except for this guy. But you're seeing this indent in the in the top of the of the creature's head. This one has what's called the flame brow. 
we all see all of these have this downturn kind of snarling mouth. Um, yeah, and then um, these are, you see these, you definitely think Olmec. It's a very distinctive form of material culture. There are also carved celts. So these are mostly greenstone, very highly polished, but then you can see there's actual designs et etched right into them. Sometimes infilled with, you know, cinnabar. This is that a red pigment that would have helped to highlight the decoration even more. We're seeing, you know, this snarling mouth again, cleft head, another cleft head. And this guy here, he's got the crossed bands in his eyes. He's also wearing, you know, what appears to be a wear jaguar sort of headdress. Greenstone figurines are also very, very Olmec. They're very highly polished. Um, and you can see a lot of the similar facial features and expressions as we saw in the masks. Um, this one, this one here is holding a wear, wear jaguar baby, which is a very common motif or common thing that we see. And then this woman here actually has, um, probably a pyrite mirror that was um, on her chest and is we see we actually find those in the archaeological record too. Then there are these what are called hollow baby figurines. So these were made of clay. They're really creepy if you ask me. Um, but they're typically only found in funerary and ritual deposits in Morelos and Puebla. So this is further west from the Gulf Coast the Gulf Coast. Um, these are often bury or broken before they're buried and it's thought that maybe they were possible surrogates for infant sacrifice which I'll explain a little bit more in a, in, in a bit or maybe they were symbols of spiritual rebirth for the people they were they were buried with it's really un, it's really unclear still and of course there's always pottery um, as I said, some of these things are depicting very naturalistic images, so this bird or fish here. But then we start to see very highly stylized or abstracted depictions of animals. This is um, maybe another feathered serpent sort of thing with the flame brow. Um, the paw, paw, paw wing motif, so it's you kind of see it as a wing that also could be the paw. I don't really know much about it. Um, crossed bands. This is, you know, obviously some kind of wear jaguar depiction on a on a vessel from Morelos, so outside of the, the Gulf homeland. But we don't have a ton of pottery because unfortunately the soils are very acidic and don't um, don't make for good preservation. So there's five major themes that we find in Olmec art, and I'm gonna take you through an example examples of each of these. So starting with leaders. Um, these are, we see individually, individuals being represented, and especially that's being presented and expressed in the decoration of their headdresses or helmets. Um, it's possible these symbolize their group membership, but you can definitely see, while they they look like they could be related to each other, they're, they're definitely um, have this, these individual traits as well. Leaders are also depicted as central figures on some of the stela. You can see and tell them apart because they have these elaborate headdresses that they're wearing. Um, they're also holding some sort of club or scepter that would have maybe signified their, um, their leadership role. They're also carved in a slightly higher relief than some of the other figures on them. So you can see this guy stands out a bit more than some of the, the individuals surrounding him. Uh, second one is supernaturals or supernatural realms. So this monument comes from Las Limas, a, a, a smaller Olmec site. It's the largest known greenstone sculpture. It weighs about 130 pounds, so it's a pretty large, pretty large monument in itself. And it's actually a depiction of a youth holding a what's called a limp wear jaguar baby. So you can see, you know, it's this nasty kind of baby figure, cross bands, very Olmec, um, downturned mouth, but maybe not alive, we're not really sure. Um, this is, this monument has been interpreted as being representative of a, you know, mythical journey to the underworld, maybe infant sacrifice, we're not really sure. What makes this figure unique, though, are the depictions of individual gods or mythical creatures actually tattooed onto the person's body. 
so we're seeing you know things four particular deities represented the banded eye god which has a similar distinction distinction here with this band going across the eyes very similar to what's actually tattooed onto the youth's face there's the bird monster who has this little flame eyebrow a fish or shark monster and then what's considered the olmec dragon it's a, a motif that's repeated over and over again <clears throat> as far as supernatural realms go these altar thrones are often seen as representing a tripartite cosmos and we see that in that if you can imagine someone would have been seated on top of the throne, they would have then been viewed as being within this celestial realm. Um, and that's because they'd be sitting on top of what's considered the earth monster. So that's this kind of jaguar mouth you can see here. You see its fangs are open. This is actually potentially its mouth where it's a it's depicting a cave or an opening into the underworld from which this individual is emerging. Which this same altar actually um, shows us the concept of mythical ancestry. So the person who's emerging out of this underworld cave is actually holding on to a cord. And the cord is connecting them to other people who are depicted on the sides and on the back of this altar. So this is showing their their connection to their ancestors. Some people have thought of this as an actual umbilical cord connecting them to their to their ancestors. Uh, another concept of mythical ancestry is um, they Olmec believed, or we think they believed, they were descendant from this were jaguar race. So, you know, an actual mating that would have occurred between a jaguar and uh, and a woman would have created these little nasty were jaguar babies that we see represented over and over again. So in this one, in this altar, we're seeing someone coming out of the underworld holding one of these little babies. Um, but then there's also depictions of leaders or rulers wearing headdresses and in interacting with were jaguar babies in different ways. So in Olmec art, we also see history or commemoration of specific events. In this stela, we're actually seeing two figures who are facing one another and are maybe was a passing of the torch in a certain way. You know, the older gentleman has this beard, which is actually a bit strange. And to see in Olmec art, perhaps they were visiting from somewhere else. So this is signifying the meeting between two different people. But this headdress the guy on the left is wearing is pretty intense and um, shows that he's kind of surrounded by maybe his ancestors or maybe deities who are visiting and communing with him. Another example is um, another monument from La Venta. This is actually depicting a person holding maybe a flag or a pennant, and it's been interpreted as a possible commemoration of a journey or the conquest of a particular area. And that is because we see there's this footprint, so obviously some kind of journey or movement across space. And these three symbols on the right are potentially uh, a place name. So maybe it would have, if we knew the pictographs and what they meant, we would know what place this is um, referring to in general. And then last but not least is this concept of sh um, shamanism or shamanism. These are individuals who are shown um, either in a transformed state. So you see it's, you know, it's a human with a feline head. Um, there's an example, I couldn't find a good photo of it, of a human head actually emerging from behind a feline face. Um, this active crouch stance is also very, very indicative of shaman. They're also shown as contortionists. In fact, sometimes it was believed that as they're flipping through the air, they're able to transform from human to feline or whatever their spirit animal is. But this is a very, very Olmec sort of thing. <clears throat> in this monument, we're actually seeing a, sh a shaman riding on what is believed to be the earliest depiction of the feathered serpent. So it's, you know, it's a rattlesnake, we can tell, but it's a little, the rattle on its tail. But this guy is just kind of hanging out with a pouch of maybe some kind of hallucinogenic drugs um, riding around on the feathered serpent. So... <clears throat> 
Now, why I talk about these themes is because, you know, these, while the monuments, the big stone monuments are more concentrated in the heartland along the Gulf Coast, these are all sites that we, where we see Olmec art, the poor, more of the portable art um, found during this time. So these things are found all the way into central Mexico at sites of Tlatilco and Zalpacoya, also at San Jose Magote in the Valley of Oaxaca. And Chalcatzingo is a very um, highly cited case. It's a site located below a, a, a mountain range. It seems to have that cleft head sort of appearance. And there are a few um, carvings in particular that seem very Olmec. <clears throat> so this leads to several ideas on the nature of regional interaction between these areas at this time. One hypothesis was that the Olmec were actually colonizing some of these other areas, but this is not so likely because we see there's evidence of pre-Olmec occupations in these areas. Perhaps Olmec artists were actually traveling to the other cities. Um, so if there is any monumental art at a distant site, it was more likely to have been created there locally. So probably Olmec artisans were going out. Or it's just simply evidence of long distance exchange by Olmec merchants. So going out and actually peddling their art and which would help to explain not only the access to resources, but this wide distribution of Olmec art. Or it could just be uh, the imitation of Olmec style by local elites. So these are people who, um, now that the Olmec style was associated with elite status, people were adopting it and using it um, themselves to help to bolster, the, bolster their own status locally. There are a few other things. So in terms of regional interaction, we do have evidence of craft specialists within Olmec sites. So in some cases, there would have been what are considered attached specialists. So these are people who were supported by the elite and would have dedicated themselves full time to their craft. However, there are also independent specialists. These are people who just kind of do their craft on the side. Um, we see this with obsidian blade production especially in the highland villages rather than some of these lowland centers. <clears throat> but there is definitely a long-distance exchange happening. So, for example, the precious stones, the green stone, jadeite, and serpentine is coming from 200 to 400 kilometers away. This is more likely in Chiapas or in Guatemala. Guatemala excuse me. These ilmenite cubes, it's a particular sort of mineral that was very shiny. You can imagine it would have been used in maybe making mirrors. But for example, there's thousands of them in this cache found from San Lorenzo, I'm pretty sure. Um, obviously, also obsidian blade production, their sources, the distance over which their sources um, they had access to are increasing over time. We start seeing obsidian coming in from central and western Mexico, but also the Maya Highlands. Also, there's the possibility of Quetzal feathers that would have come in from um, neighboring tropical regions. <clears throat> so this brings me to a major theoretical debate when it comes to the Olmec. This is the mother culture versus sister cultures debate. When I talk about the mother culture, this is referring to a one-way flow of cultural traits or this artistic style moving out of the Olmec region. The people who follow this theory believe or argue that the Olmec were not the sole contributors, but were definitely the first to develop features that are adopted, these Mesoamerican features that are adopted by later groups. But when it comes down to it, these, the mother culture means, you know, these the hallmarks of Olmec culture were first established in the Gulf Coast heartland. On the other hand, when we look at the sister cultures, this is a theory that says Mesoamerican cultures evolved more or less simultaneously in different places. They argue that the Olmec were the first among equals rather than being this wellspring of cultural change. But in, in, when it, at the core of it, it implies that Olmec style may have originated elsewhere. Could have happened at Tlatilco in central Mexico, for example. This, this, these theories have been tested exhaustively, especially using ceramic analysis. So there's two studies in particular. Um, there's been an INAA analysis of more than a thousand sherds, and this is 
uh, it's instrumental neutron activation analysis. So they're testing the actual composition, chemical composition of the pottery. And they tested that in comparison to several, to 275 clays. And what they ended up finding is that, yeah, the majority of pottery with this Olmec style was made in the homeland and exchanged elsewhere. However, another group of scientists did a petrographic analysis of only 20 sherds, and they found that five of them that were found at San Lorenzo actually were produced with materials from Oaxaca. So they argued that instead, this style was developed elsewhere and then brought into and, you know, probably enhanced in the Olmec region. A lot of back and forth, articles being written, and really, it, I tend to side more with the INAA, but uh, it's definitely still debated. Um, which brings us to more of this middle ground, uh, what they call maybe a promiscuous father culture. So that meaning that, um, you know, this there was several offspring um, of cultural styles, cultural traditions happening in different places all across Mesoamerica. <clears throat> in that in that regard, this Olmec influence would have merged with other local traditions, which creates these varied expressions that we see in 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 Olmec style. The Olmec, however, can be associated with several firsts, one of which was bloodletting. We don't actually see explicit depictions of this like we will among the Maya, but there are these stingray spines or maguey thorns that would have been actually used to prick your finger, your tongue, something that would have allowed the elite or the ruler's blood to be used in different ceremonies. Human sacrifice, perhaps, um, it's a bit specul speculative still. There are no scenes that actually show human sacrifice, but we do see those limp wear jaguar babies at times. Um, at El Manati in particular, there are disarticulated skulls and femurs that are found, but also the complete skeletons of newborn or unborn children. So this is where this idea of possible infant sacrifice um, has come from. The first evidence of writing or epigraphy. There's also the first long count dates. So there are six artifacts with the earliest long count dates found, and those are found outside of the Maya area. So it's always been thought the long count was developed originally by the Maya, but it's more likely could have happened around the time of the Olmec instead. One thing that goes, a piece of evidence that goes against this is that the Olmec civilization had already come to an end around 400 BCE, which is actually centuries before the earliest known long count date artifact. We'll look at that in a minute. Finally, the Mesoamerican ball game. So when we talk about Olmec writing, it's very hieroglyphic, um, which just means it's more pictographic uh, rather than actual words or letters being used. Um, it's possible that this developed as a status marker. It often involves rulers' names or dates, but also very animalistic sort of things. And the earliest known one, I think, is the seal below here from La Venta, dating to around 1300 BCE. Um, one artifact in particular is called the Cascajal Block. It was found in 1999 and published on in 2006. It is a serpentine stone block with script writing that was found in the Veracruz area. And it dates to the first millennium BCE, so the finders claim that it dates to around 900 BCE. But this is based only on the, t the timing or the dating of the majority of pottery that was found in this same context. So the object itself has not actually been dated yet. Um, like it comes from a very disturbed context, so it's possible that you know the pottery that collected there isn't wasn't necessarily there when the block was deposited. When we take a look at the symbols themselves, we see there are 28 distinct elements or glyphs, but some of these are re repeated up to four times, so there are 62 glyphs in all. And these glyphs are actually linked to other signs from known Olmec iconography, suggesting that they would have had pretty widespread use. But in, it's been verified that this block is ancient. There's mineralization and patina, it's like the wear and like things being deposited on it is actually found inside the incisions themselves. So it's not like it's some old block that 
someone's trying to scam us with by incising it with these images. It's a legitimate find. So what's the significance of this? Well, the use and its meaning is, is unknown. It's possibly ritual. It was not found in a public context, and it's actually a pretty small block with really faint writing. I mean, you can hardly see it in this image on the right. <clears throat> But if these dates are valid, then this is the oldest script ever found in Mesoamerica. It dates 500 years before the earliest Maya writing. While it appears unrelated to later Maya and other Mesoamerican writing, it's significant for two reasons. It means that the Maya were not the first or the only people to develop full script in the New World. And this actually adds you know, a new layer of complexity to what we know about the Olmec civilization. I mentioned there are some long count dates. This one in particular is from Sila C in Tres Portes. So we can see on the front side, very Olmec style art, the turned down face, the flame brow, cross bands, everything. And then the back side, this is the long count date. So we see kind of an introductory glyph, and then we see a sequence of bars and lines. And we're gonna talk about this more um, when we talk about the Maya. But the symbols themselves translate in the long count to the day September 3rd, 32 BCE. So even if you believe that the Olmec were still around around 100 CE, this date and this object post-date what we call the Olmec. So we're not still sure if the Olmec did invent this or not, but it's still a pretty interesting find. <laughs> So I also mentioned they maybe have been the first people to invent the ball game. Um, there are 12 rubber balls that were found in this, at the site of El Manati, and these actually predate the earliest known ball courts. So there are no ball courts in the Olmec area, but we have evidence in the style of some of the figurines that were carved, as well as you can see the, the helmet this guy has on. It could be similar to some of the colossal heads. For the game itself, the rules are, as far as we know, were no hands or feet. They tended to use their hips, most likely. That's why they would have had this belt uh, or padding around their hip area, and that's maybe where they would have hit the ball from. They're also were depicted usually with you know some kind of ornamentation. This guy's the mirror on his chest. Even if it was invented by the um, by the Olmec, it's it's developed even further later on by the Maya, um, Toltec, and other and Aztec as well. This find in particular is really interesting. Um, it's, it's been interpreted as a ball player. He's actually slightly larger than life size, and its head would have been removed prehistorically. This is how it was found. Again, wearing this ornament, uh, mirror ornament on his chest. He has the thick belt or padding around his waist. But the really cool thing is that the arms, which were likely wooden, would have been movable. So these are kind of like ratchet sockets for the arms that would have been able to move around and get repositioned into different, in different ways. All right, we're going to end with a summary of the major centers or major sites in the area, starting with Almanati. Then we'll talk about San Lorenzo, the early, early pre-classic center. La Venta from the Middle Preclassic, and then Trace Sapotes for Late Preclassic. So El Manati, it's located at the foot of Cerro Manati, which is about 15 kilometers southeast of San Lorenzo, and actually would have been visible from the site. It's interpreted as a sacred landscape because it combines a water, water, a hill, and hematite, a hematite source, which is used to make this red pigment and could have signified blood. The site itself is a sacrificial bog that was used from 1600 to 1200 BCE. There are no known residences near, near this site. Um, it was just a place for making ritual sacrifices. And the anaerobic conditions actually make for really incredible preservation. So this, this bust you're seeing on the right is carved out of wood, and this is how it came out of the ground. So it's pretty incredible preservation. The offerings themselves include 37 wooden busts that were originally wrapped in mats and left with, with grave goods, the 12 rubber balls that I already mentioned, 
but also dismembered skulls and femurs and the bones of newborn or unborn infants. One of the most recent discoveries is um, they did some residue analysis on pottery and they found that it would have been used to consume cacao, which is the chocolate drink that we, we know very well from Mesoamerican cultures. The offerings themselves are positioned in three levels with increasing elaboration over time. So the earliest ones, um, deposits were just simple silts, these carved greenstone objects in ceramics. In the middle phase, we see um, maybe the silts actually positioned into little groups or arrangements. And then finally, in the last phase, we see the wooden busts themselves, more silts, and um, the rubber balls as well, as you can see depicted here. All right, the first major center was San Lorenzo, dates from 1200 to 900 BCE. It's the largest Mesoamerican city at this time. It's situated in a large agricultural area, actually not in the swamplands itself. And the area over which you know, the greater population would have been could have produced about 500 ton tons of maize annually, which would have fed over 5,500 people. The population at San Lorenzo was probably about that, 5,500 people, but within the hinterland itself could have been anywhere up to 13,000 people. So the site, is located on a massive platform, which you can see depicted on the right here, and has been it's been noticed that it's in the shape of a bird, perhaps. I'm you know, I leave that up to you. But what they actually ended up doing was modifying an existing plateau. So they would have carried massive amounts of earth up onto the plateau itself to fill it in to create, you know, level living surface. Um it's it's a massive project, it's a massive undertaking. 18 to 71 million cubic feet of earthen fill, sometimes up to seven, meet, seven meters thick, so very impressive labor mobilization. What you can see are some of these deep fissures. So this is a topographic map. You can see there are some areas that would have been left as sort of natural ramps, um, and it's thought that this was done intentionally to help bring some of the building supplies and also trade goods up onto the elite, into the area where the elite lived. There's been two major excavation projects, one done in the 60s by Michael Coe, which gave us the, the early date of 1500 BCE, and also ended up creating the map that you saw on the previous slide. Then Anne Cipher's work there in the late 90s into 2004, and she focused more on the residential terraces that surrounded the site. But she also found what's been termed the Red Palace and a monument recarving workshop nearby. At San Lorenzo, there are 124 stone sculptures that have been found, and they're made from the Tuxlas Mountains source, basalt source, which is about 60 kilometers away. The commoners, while the elites would have lived up on the plateau itself, the commoners lived more on the slopes that would have stepped down to about 40 meters below the summit. As I already mentioned, they lived in these thatched wattle and daub houses. And the construction of the terraces themselves was also a major labor, or a massive labor event. Here's a few of the extra monuments that were found at San Lorenzo. Again, seeing the same sorts of motifs or style <clears throat> The elites themselves will have lived in large structures on top of the platforms, like you see here. The Red Palace in particular, um, though, would have had, it was constructed using earthen walls that were stained red with hematite, hence the Red Palace name. And then there were also major basalt columns that helped to support the roof. A really significant and interesting um, feature of San Lorenzo is an elaborate drainage system. They would have been covered or buried, um, but it consists of channeled stones that were used as kind of pseudo pipes. And um, you can see the carved stone drains here. Um, so especially in the image on the right, you can see how they kind of sealed them off and then buried, um, buried the drains themselves. So the bringing in of water was a very significant feature of the site. They would have helped to direct water from an elevated spring nearby onto the plateau for use. Um, in ritual, but also maybe for waste. 
These are a few other features associated associated with the drains. One um, very interesting find is the sculpture of a possible rain god. You know, he's got the very um, typical Olmec characteristics, but his the backside actually is hollowed out, and he the the, the sculpture was found buried face down as part of the, the drainage system. So definitely associated with water, perhaps an early rain deity. We'll never, we're not really sure at this time. San Lorenzo also had a basalt workshop and a monument reworking workshop. So this is indicative of the fact that the these materials in particular and the creation of the monuments were under elite control. So these are, this is where the term attached specialists um, comes from. But all good things must come to an end. Um, they traded obsidian and semi-precious stones with many parts of Mesoamerica right up until their de the decline of San Lorenzo around 900 BCE, which is when we see La Venta take over. There are some monuments that were mutilated around 950 BCE, um, and as I mentioned before, this is potentially due to internal uprising or an invasion. If it was done by the Olmecs themselves, perhaps it was took place after the death of a ruler. Um, but more likely, um, there was a change in course of the river, and that would have actually led to environmental changes and a shift in the location of the Olmec Center. So, we move to Laventa, which was occupied from 900 to 400 BCE. It's built on a small island in, a, in the coastal swamp that overlooked the then active Rio Palma River. It's again on a large rectangular earthen mound. And this layout that we see of having, you know, a pyramid facing onto an open plaza area that's demarcated by other lower structures, as well as this north-south orientation, this is something that becomes really common later on. But rather than mason reconstruction, which we see later in later civilizations, all of this was built from earth or clay. So it's thought that these um, base that the platforms themselves would have been bases for more perishable constructions on top, so temples, palaces, priestly quarters, things like that. And the Great Pyramid, which you see here, Complex C, was the largest structure of its time. It's, uh, it's built from about 100,000 cubic meters of clay or earth and has a conical shape that stands about 110 feet tall, so it's a pretty impressive structure. There's been a few different excavation projects at the site, but there are actually no regional settlement pattern data yet, so no surveys have been conducted in the areas around La Venta. But the site itself contains several spectacular displays of power and wealth. Um, but again, we see at 400 BCE, roughly, that Laventa was destroyed and the monuments, again, were defaced. So something happened. Maybe it's just the way the Olmec um, closed down a site. <laughs> wanted to show you quickly a few of the impressive displays of wealth. So there's 50 separate caches that have been found within this complex A. So this is the area just to the north of the Great Pyramid. The mosaics, there's three major mosaics measuring about 15 by 20 feet in size, and they involve 485 serpentine blocks to create them. This you can see on the left here is what it looked like when they excavated. So, and obviously, you know, we've got a nice National Geographic depiction of maybe what this would have looked like when it was created and then buried. And that's the thing. This is a... Um, massive artistic undertaking and they created it and then it was immediately buried. It's not like something was, you know, lived and seen. It was it was built and then completely buried. So it's some sort of sacrifice, um, symbolic sacrifice. Another famous um, cache is this celt and figurine cache and you're seeing them actually here on display exactly how they were found and oriented at the time they were um, uncovered. So you can see in, the, in these two images what it looked like when it was actually being excavated. And so it's thought that this particular offering was dedicated 
in association with a new building phase in um, just to the north of the Great Pyramid, which would have dated to around 600 BCE. There are also columnar basalt tombs that have been found. Um, in this one in particular at Laventa, there were few poorly preserved bones. Unfortunately, the environment's too humid for preserving human remains, but it was a very rich burial. Lots of grave goods were left behind. <laughs> And you can see the tomb itself was constructed from these columnar basalts and then buried under the earth. This is a replica of it at the uh, National Museum in Mexico City. All right, so our final site is Tres Zapotes. Dates, the Olmec occupation dates from 500 to 100 BCE. So this is a late pre-classic transition site. It was actually occupied for 2000 years, which is incredible. Um, so it, it, it moves us beyond the traditional Olmec dates into what are called the Epi-Olmec and the Classic periods. It's located west of the Chukchula Mountains and east of the Rio Papalo Papaloapan River, which would have provided these people with access to not only the forested uplands, but also any kind of river delta resources. There is a site nearby called Rancho La Cobada, and that actually might have been a monument workshop during earlier, earlier periods. So the Trace Sapote site, um, as far as its Olmec population, we, you know, we see these two colossal heads. There are columnar basalts used in their construction, and as well as carved stela. But it's more primarily an epi-Olmec site. So especially the map you see here to the right, this is, this is all post-dating, you know, the Olmec cutoff, basically. We see very heavy influence of, um, from the Izapan area in Chiapas. The sculptures that we do find here tend to lack the refinement and detail of monuments found at the two other major centers. But this is where we see the Olmec writing and the long count calendar date. So, to bring it all together, um, the socio-political organization of the Olmec. Well, we see that they definitely had social stratification. There are individual depictions of, monument, of leaders um, on monuments or as monuments themselves. There was geographic and demographic centralization. So elites had control over water access and monumental stone, and they definitely used it to exert their command and legitimize their regime. We see this succession of centers, so San Lorenzo, La Venta, Tres Apotes. However, none of these sites seem to ever have controlled the entire homeland. They controlled the area around them, but not, not everything, not everyone, that's for sure. One particular example is sites near the Tupsula Mountains um, seem to have been more egalitarian and outside the control of these lowland centers. There's definitely craft specialization. There are people who were dedicated 100% to creation of monuments, lapidary, jewelry, obsidian, and other forms of portable art. Very obvious labor mobilization, the creation of these large ceremonial centers um, involved lots of manpower, <clears throat> the construction of pyramids, um, carving and transportation of the monuments. You know, these are people who knew how to boss other people around. It is assumed though that they did they did not have a standing army. Just a point of curiosity. So all of that together suggests definitely a complex chiefdom. However, um, the evidence of proto-writing, massive labor mobilization, and long-lasting centers, about 300 years, suggests the possibility of greater social complexity. So, you know, it's still, still an answer that remains, a question that remains to be answered. So the decline of the Olmec. Well, it's uh, very likely a combination of factors, which, you know, seems to be a theme in archaeology. Could have been warfare, environmental change, economic decline, um, but the changing course of the rivers seems to definitely have been significant and unique to their location along the Gulf Coast. Volcanic eruptions did occur throughout the formative, so this would have forced the Olmec to move their settlements over time. Around 400 to 350 BCE, we see the eastern portion of the homeland was completely depopulated. It's, 
It's believed that either tectonic upheavals or maybe even the silting up of the rivers made this area unsuitable for large-scale agriculture and river transport, so perhaps that's why everybody left. But Tres Zapotes in the western area continues to be occupied beyond this. However, it doesn't have those Olmec hallmarks, so we're, we're not sure. Um, but they were definitely well connected, so the Epi-Olmec culture, you know, what comes after that in this area, is very strongly associated with the Azapa culture um, located in Chiapas, down on the Pacific Coast area. So maybe people moved to join them. It's really unclear. So that brings us to an end for the Olmec. <laughs>